Hi, I'm Alistair. I'm a games designer. And in this video, I want to teach you how to make this electronic puzzle. So, in my hand, I have a MIDI keyboard. This is connected via this wire here to an Arduino. And the Arduino also has on this side of it a small uh, buzzer. And then up here, I've got a row of LED uh, strip. And I've got a 12 volt mag lock, which is connected through this relay here back to the Arduino again. So, the idea of the puzzle is that the players have to play a melody on the keyboard here. And when they press any of the notes, what happens is the Arduino is going to compare the note pressed to a pre-stored um, melody that's saved in the code somewhere. So it can be any tune you want, um, any length you want as well. Now, if the player presses the correct note for the next uh, note in the melody, it's going to light one of these LEDs up here green. Uh, in a row, and when all of the LEDs have been lit up, the maglock here is going to be released. So that's the idea. Let me show you it in action. So the first thing I'm going to do is attach this uh, bar onto the maglock. So at the moment, it's going to be locked like that. And if I start off by just pressing uh, arbitrary keys here, you'll see what happens is that uh, the LEDs just light up red to indicate that that's a incorrect note. Now the melody I happen to know starts on a D. So if I press a D you'll see the first LED lights up green instead. Uh, the next note is a G, uh, so D, G, B flat, A. Now if I get the next note wrong, uh, what will happen is that it will flash red and then I'm back to the beginning of the uh, puzzle again. So I'll play the whole thing correctly. I'm gonna pause there, that's one note before the end. So when I press the last note, which is gonna be a G, what's gonna happen is the Maglock will release. I will attempt to catch it in my hand, and if I do, there'll be rapturous applause from the audience. And the uh, LED strip will just change into a chase sequence, just to show that the player uh, has completed the puzzle. So, final note, G, here we go. Caught the maglock, LED sequence, uh, chase sequence, rapturous applause from audience. Thank you. Okay, so let me uh, say in a little bit more detail about what's going on here now. So let me start by saying a bit more about uh, the keyboard. So this is going to be the input that the player uses into the device. Now I'm using a uh, the keytar controller that comes with a rock band on the Wii. Um, the reason I'm using this is because I picked it up very cheaply. Um, Wii's are kind of out of fashion now and you can get these devices um, on eBay or sort of pick them up at a, on a high street shop that's got a load of stock that they're trying to get rid of. Um, so this was uh, about £15 and it's got a standard MIDI DIN output on the end of it here. Um, now, you could use this um, as it was and it, it would be nice to maybe dress it up in a prop and make it look more like an organ. You could use any other MIDI keyboard you want as well or even a MIDI drum kit or anything like that that produces a standard uh, serial MIDI output. Now the one thing to notice about this is it is literally just a controller. It is not actually a synthesizer or a keyboard, so it makes no sound on its own. All it does is register the input of the keys that are played. So for that reason, that's why I've got the uh, buzzer attached to the Arduino here. Because the first thing the Arduino is going to do when it actually detects an input from the keyboard is play a tone on that buzzer there. Now, when you heard the video demonstration at the beginning, or in fact if I press it again now here, you'll notice that that's not a particularly nice sound. It doesn't really sound like an organ or anything else like that, because it's simply using a, a very straightforward buzzer, and it's using the tone function on the Arduino to make that sound. But what you could do instead, if you wanted to, is to use uh, the MIDI output, or the MIDI through of the Arduino here, and send that keynote to a proper MIDI device, uh, which could simulate any sound you wanted. So if you were in a, a you know, you wanted to make a big church organ sound, or if you wanted a, a piezo, um, uh, not a piezo, a pizzicato string plucking sound, or a piano sound, anything you wanted to, you could send it into a MIDI device. Or you could even do something better than that. You could send, depending on the output, depending on the note played, maybe you could have servos attached to pins here that hit hammers, that played uh, bells or chimes or anything like that. So the point to note is that the keyboard itself, this is just the input. This is not actually making the sound you hear. Um, this is what's making the sound you hear and I've just used a very simple uh, output here, but you could make that 
a lot more interesting depending on how you wanted to theme this puzzle. Uh, the LED strip here, this is a um, pretty uh, standard thing which I've, I've shown used in other puzzle tutorials as well. So this is what's called a, a WS2812B uh, strip, commonly referred to as NeoPixels. You can get um, different lengths and just cut them how you want. Um, now, I like having a visual feedback for the player um, to let them know that they've played a note. Oh, one more thing I haven't shared. If I, by the way, when the puzzle is solved, so at the moment it's in the solve state, because that chase sequence says, I've um, mapped a note on the keyboard to reset the puzzle as well. So I've set it to this high B flat. If I press that, you'll see the puzzle goes back into the running state again. So uh, the maglock has re-locked again. So that's just a convenient way to, to reset the puzzle. Um, so, I, you know, I, I like having the fact that the player can see that they're progressing. It feels like they're following... Uh, a sequence and they're getting towards an end. What it does mean is that in theory a player can guess the correct melody in this case because they just hit keys until they happen to um, work out the pattern that gets them all the way to the end. Now you might not want that. You might want them to have to find the correct sequence of keys somewhere else. Um, and I've played puzzles where the letters of the keys have spelt a particular word. So, I mean, F-A-C-E would be face, or D-E-A-D -E is dead, or whatever. Um, so you may or may not want to use that visual feedback, but, but it's there if you want it. And then the maglock. Again, I've used this in other puzzles in the past. This is a fairly standard 12-volt fail-safe maglock, and it's being controlled by a 5-volt relay here from the Arduino. So the Arduino um, compares the sequence of notes that are played, and when it's got to the complete length of the sequence that's been programmed, it simply sends a signal to the relay here that deactivates the maglock. Um, now, the MIDI input on the Arduino here, I'm actually using a, a MIDI shield, which I bought, but you can also uh, make your own. So this is actually a MIDI shield I made, um, which basically has the same functionality. This one just has a MIDI in and a MIDI out. This one has a through as well. Um, they're not too difficult to make. You basically need to get um, these kind of connectors here, the, the five pin MIDI DIN connectors. You can buy these online and you also need a fast optocoupler. Um, now if you want to make your own shields, I'll give you um, the instructions on how you want to do that. It's a little bit fiddly and also I found a lot of references on the internet. Even though MIDI is a standard that's been around for like 25, 30 years now, there's so much wrong information about the correct way to wire these pins I found when I was doing this. You might find it easier just for the sake of a couple of dollars to buy a MIDI shield like this, um, which just slots under your Arduino. Or you can make your own one. Um, it, it's the same result either way. Um, but I'll show you how to do that if you want to make your own. So now let me show you how everything's laid out. And I've got that uh, here in Fritzing. So I've got my uh, MIDI input device at the bottom here, and that's the MIDI out uh, port of that is connected to the MIDI in uh, of the shield on the Arduino there. Now, uh, one thing to note at this point is that the um, MIDI shield I'm using, and I think in common with most MIDI shields, uses the hardware serial connection of the Arduino, and that is mapped to pins uh, zero and one. You may have seen in um, lots of example Arduino sketches when you have kind of when you use the GPIO pins for controlling various inputs and outputs, a lot of them start from pin two, and um, you may or may not have noticed that. But uh, pins zero and one, the reason for that is that they are the receive and transmit pins, which are assigned to the hardware serial, and that means that those are the ones which are used when uh, if you do a serial dot print command uh, over a USB connection or when you upload code to the Arduino itself through a USB connection it's using those pins uh, onto the chip to actually uh, for communication so normally you don't want to use those uh, in your code but there are times uh, when you want to control stuff and you don't want to have sort of a, a software emulation of a serial link you actually want to use a serial chip which is on the Arduino itself and that's going to be the case when you use MIDI connection uh, you want to make sure that you've got a fast uh, 
um, uh, board rate and that you're not dropping any MIDI notes that might arrive on that serial buffer. So for that reason, you can't use the serial connection at the same time as the MIDI connection. Um, so you can't do serial.print and do de debugging information, which is what you'd uh, often do in code like this uh, while you're using the MIDI. Now my MIDI shield, and one of the reasons why I did uh, choose to use a shield in the end rather than my own homemade one, uh, has a little switch uh, on it which enables you to uh, deactivate the MIDI input which will enable the serial input and then you can switch it back across to switch between whether you want the MIDI or the USB to use the hardware serial link. Um, now I could have made that on my own shield as well but I didn't have the the uh, parts at the time. But that is just one thing to be aware of that when you're doing this you can still power your Arduino through the USB connection but you won't be able to do uh, USB communication when you've also got the MIDI input using pin 0 and 1. Uh, okay. So uh, then on this side here, I've got um, my little buzzer. That's an active buzzer. That's connected to pin 9 through a 100 ohm uh, resistor here. Um, so if I zoom in, you can actually see that here. So this uh, resistor here going into the positive connection of the buzzer, and then it's grounded on the other side. And then over on this side of the board, I've got, uh, this is my strip uh, of NeoPixel lights. Uh, so I've got a capacitor connected between ground and 5 volt. This is always a good idea because when uh, if you activate a lot of the LEDs, they can have a sort of a, a sudden inrush of current. They actually draw a surprising amount of current. And that capacitor there is just going to help make sure that it doesn't uh, place too much of a load on the uh, Arduino all at one time. So it's just a smoothing capacitor uh, for 70 microfarads on that. And then I've got a resistor on the data inline on the middle. Um, so this resistor here, uh, it's a 330 ohm resistor, but anything between about 300 and 500 will do on that, um, just between the signal pin and the data in line. And I'm using uh, A0 as the signal pin for that. It doesn't need to be uh, an analog pin. It can be any pin. Um, it's just I'm using that one because it happened to be on the correct side of the board. That's all. And then here I've got uh, the relay module. So uh, similar to the, the pixel strips, it needs a ground and a 5 volt connection, which go in here. And then um, this is actually a two channel relay, um, which is what I had lying around. I'm only using one of the channels. I'm actually using channel two. Uh, so I've got uh, the channel two signal line going into A1 here. Um, uh, so if you have a single relay module, you can use that uh, yourself. Or if, like me, you've got a two-channel relay, um, you just have to use one of the channels and you can leave the other one blank. We're not going to make use of that uh, in this particular project. And when a high or low signal is sent through that signal line there, that's what's going to flip the relay on this side uh, between the normally closed and the normally open position. So what I've got here, this is a 12 volt DC input and this is a 12 volt maglock. But I've got them wired into the common and the normally open connection. So what that means is that this, there's, there's kind of a break between these two wires here by default. And the relay is not going to be energized because it doesn't have a closed circuit all the way back to this uh, input here. However, when the Arduino sends a signal to this blue line here, what it's going to do is it makes the, um, the connector on the relay on this side flip over and it's going to connect the common wire here and the normally open connection here. And when that happens, this is going to form a closed circuit here. The maglock is going to receive uh, 12 volts of power and it's going to become energized. So, and then obviously in reverse, um, when the uh, when the opposite signal is sent to this blue line here, the relay is going to switch back across. This will be broken, and the maglock will release. And here's the code that's running on the Arduino. So we start off at the beginning with including any of the libraries um, which I'm using to help provide some of the functions here. So I'm using the fast LED library. Um, that's to control the uh, pixel strip if you want to use an LED pixel strip like that. And you can download that from the following link here. The code itself is on GitHub as well. Um, so you can check through all the code there.
Uh, I'm also using a uh, MIDI library. Now to start with I just um, wrote my own library that was just looking at the serial connection and examining the bytes there. Um, MIDI messages are not that complicated. Um, there's basically a, a single byte at the beginning that says the sort of MIDI message it is, like whether it's a note on or a note off or a program change. Um, and then the following bytes will give you things like the pitch and the velocity of the note. Um, but then I, I found this MIDI library which basically uh, already did what I'd written myself and did it a little bit neater um, so I decided to use that instead. There's a couple of different MIDI libraries available. Um, the one I'm using, if you go to um, the library manager in the Arduino IDE, it's this one here. So it's called MIDI Library by 47FX. Uh, um, so that's the one I'm, I'm using here. All it does is it just provides a, a wrapper around the MIDI functionality and just makes it a little bit easier to call the MIDI messages, that's all. And then I've got uh, two other includes here. Um, so note list, this is actually a, um, this is a structure. And the reason for including this is because um, it's possible obviously for a player to press more than one key at the same uh, time. So if all we ever did was to look at the most recent key pressed uh, and played the note of that, and let's say they pressed another key at the same time but then released the first key, um, we need to keep a track of any other notes that are being held down at the same time so that we can kind of return the tone to the other one. So this is uh, like an array or a list uh, structure which we'll just use to keep track of all the notes that are currently being held. It does also mean, let's say you wanted to modify the puzzle, and instead of playing a melody on the key uh, board, you actually wanted them to hold down a series of notes to make a chord uh, instead, you could also um, use it to provide that kind of functionality instead by comparing all the notes currently being held. So that's what that is. And uh, pitches.h, this is another include file. Uh, all this is, is this is basically a lookup table um, that makes it just a little bit more convenient to refer to um, certain notes. Um, so for example, uh, A4, concert A um, is uh, 440 hertz there. So it's the hertz value of a particular note. Um, and we just use that as a, uh, a convenient way of, if you're using the piezo buzzer like I am, uh, you need to supply it with a hertz value. Um, and you probably don't know what the hertz is you want, but you may well know the musical note that you want instead. So this is just a convenience function for converting between them. So that's all the includes at the top. Then we move on to the constant section. Constants are variables that are not going to change uh, throughout the duration of the program. So we define the total number of steps. This is the number of notes that are in the melody. And then we actually define what those notes are. Now, um, Again, so there's different ways of referring to the musical notes. We could refer to um, the hertz number, as I just was in the pictures file here, or we could use the musical note. For this one, though, um, I'm using the MIDI note value. Now, the reason for that is because you might be using, like I say, an input that's not actually a toned uh, musical instrument. You might be using a, a drum kit input or some other MIDI trigger whereby saying the note you know a or c or b might not make sense but every input is mapped to a unique uh, midi number so i've included a, a, a link here to a web page that will actually give you what all the midi numbers are but i can tell you that that's um d that's a, a d3 that's a g um that is a uh, b flat uh, no sorry yes da, da, da. um so this is my melody which i've defined which i've just manually keyed in the, the different keys there and that's the MIDI notes that are going to have to be played in order to solve the puzzle. I've also defined uh, another note and this is going to be the reset key so when the puzzle has been solved um, if the input that corresponds to that MIDI note value is played it's going to reset the puzzle instead and currently that's a high B flat. This is the Arduino pin that has the uh, relay signal assigned to it and that's what's going to be um, driven high to unlock the lock when the puzzle is solved. And this is the pin that has the buzzer attached to it. So if you move that onto another pin, obviously you can update those two values. They can be any of the input output pins you want. There's nothing particularly special about those. And finally, um, 
are so I mentioned that uh, list st structure that's going to keep track of more than one note played at once. Uh, this is just a limit to say uh, that's the maximum number of notes we're going to keep track of, uh, which is somewhat arbitrarily set at 16. That's probably a bit higher than it needs to be, but just in case they kind of lean on the keyboard and press all the notes at once, um, you know, I've set that quite high. It doesn't it doesn't do that much harm to have it set higher than possible. Then we move on to the globals. So globals are variables which are going to be used throughout the code by um, several different functions, for example. So uh, this here, this is what's called a macro. So a macro is uh, kind of like a, a series of uh, functions that's been de uh, defined in another library. And this comes from the MIDI library. So what this is going to do is it's saying, create a new MIDI interface, call it MIDI. Uh, we're going to use the hardware serial. So remember I mentioned this before, what it means is I'm going to use the same pins on the processor as pins 0 and 1 normally use. And that's the um, same which the USB connection uses as well. So while the puzzle is running, I'm not going to be able to use my USB serial connection for outputting any serial information. That's why uh, you might have noticed if you see my other tutorials, I normally put lots of sort of debug comments throughout the code and sort of serial.print to check the value of variables and things like that. I haven't got any of those in this code because I'm using those uh, those pins on the chip I'm using for the MIDI interface instead. This is where I create my new uh, array of notes that are being held. So it's a MIDI note list. It's got, it's as large as the maximum number of held notes, which we defined just above. And I'm calling it MIDI notes. Uh, this is a counter that's going to keep track of how far through the melody the player has got at the moment. So obviously we start at the beginning of the melody, so we start at zero. Every time they play a correct next note, that's going to increase by one until we get to the end of the melody. And we're also going to define an array of this CRGB here. This is a structure which uh, records the color value for each LED in that strip of uh, LEDs it's going to light up. So it lets us um, define the, the hue of each of those pixels, the, the red, green and blue values separately. Um, now I've created quite simple color blocks, I'm just using green, red and blue and I think yellow to reset, but you can, you can make that as complex as you want, you can have a, a changing rainbow pattern, whatever you want. But this is going to be the array that's going to keep track of the color values of every LED in that strip. And finally, I've got a uh, variable here. So first of all, I'm, I'm defining a new enumeration. So these are all the different states that the puzzle is capable of being in. Um, and it's going to start off in the initializing state. While the puzzle is running, obviously it changes to that state. And then when the puzzle is solved, it's that state. I find it quite useful to have kind of like a, a simple state machine like this, um, just to keep track of, of what's happening at the time especially if you start to make your props more complicated and you want to be able to monitor their status uh, remotely and things like that, it's just quite useful to be able to interrogate it and say, okay, what, what state are you in at the moment? What do you think you're doing? Um, so that's, I, I generally always include that at the start of the code. Okay, let's go on to look at the uh, setup function then. So setup obviously is called when the program first starts and every time it's reset from then on. So this is um, possibly a bit different from what you've seen before. So this is not actually calling a function right now, but what it's doing is it's assigning what we call a callback function. So um, the MIDI library has a number of events that it uh, listens for, and when those events occur, it triggers what's called a callback function. So what this line here says is that every time the MIDI uh, interface receives a hand, uh, receives a note on message. So every time the keyboard input has a new note being pressed, that's called a note on, what it's going to do is it's going to call this function here, handle note on, which we'll define a little bit later on. It's here. Um, so it's not actually calling this function right now, but what it is doing is it's telling the MIDI interface, whenever this note on message happens in the future, I want you to call that function. And we have a matching one, which we do for the note off messages as well. So we'll say, okay, this is going to be the callback that handles note off messages. We're going to call this function here. And I'll define those both in a minute, so I'll show you then. 
Now that we've uh, defined those callbacks, we actually begin the MIDI interface itself. Um, and this parameter here, this one, um, is defines the channel that it's listening to. So you can have up to 16 different MIDI channels. Um, the keyboard I'm using um, always transmits on channel one. So I've put a one there. Um, I think that's yeah, relatively common keyboards go on one. Certain MIDI channels are traditionally used for certain instruments. Uh, so if you have a percussion instrument, uh, a drum kit, you might find that you're using channels uh, nine or 10 or something like that. But I'm, I'm uh, listening on channel one because that is what my keyboard is going to output its messages on. Uh, then we do a little bit of initialization of the LED strip. So uh, this is pretty well documented in the fast LED library. If you're using slightly different um, LEDs than me, you might need to change this slightly. Um, but just to explain what I'm using here, so I'm using the add LEDs message, uh, add LEDs method, sorry, to tell the fast LED library about the LEDs I'm using. This is the type of LED I'm using and they are connected to pin A0 on the Arduino. Uh, GRB is the order of the bytes that are sent to that. So in this particular strip, there was green, red, blue value. Um, you might be more familiar with RGB, um, but actually pixel strips come in lots of different uh, byte order formats. So mine just happened to be GRB. If you start to use this uh, code and you realize that um, what should be green is coming out red or what should be red is coming out blue or something like that. It quite simply could be caused by having this byte order the wrong way around. It won't do any harm to your strips. All that it means is it, it's uh, kind of firing the wrong LED is mapped to the wrong uh, byte, that's all. So it's a pretty easy change to make. Um, this bit here, this tells me the array that is going to uh, contain the values for each LED to be lit. So that's what we defined at the top of the code here, this LEDs. And finally, the total number of LEDs. Obviously, I've got one LED corresponding to each note in the melody. So my number of steps is going to be equal to both the notes in the melody and also the LEDs on the strip. They'll be the same. And I'll clear the LEDs at the start. Uh, finally, we initialize the relay. So We'll set that lock pin. Uh, this is the pin that the relay is attached to on the Arduino. We'll set that to be an output and we'll initially set it as low. Now my relay is an active low relay. So sending a low message is going to connect the normally open and the common terminal. And that's gonna lock the lock. Um, you can get active high relays, you can get active low relays. Um, it's a little bit confusing. And also if you wire your mag lock into the normally closed rather than the normally open connection, that will reverse it as well. So if you find that your mag lock is kind of the opposite of what you want it to be, and that it's open when the puzzle is running and it's uh, closed when the puzzle is solved, uh, you probably need to swap that low to a high there. And finally, we'll just set the puzzle state to running so that the, um, the game can actually begin. And then we get on to the uh, handle note on function. So remember this is the, the callback function that's gonna get called uh, every time a MIDI note on uh, message is received. So every time a key is played on the keyboard basically. And it gets past three parameters, the channel that that note was on, remember I'm only listening on channel one, and the pitch and the velocity of the note as well. So the first thing we're gonna do uh, in this callback is to add the note that's just been played uh, into our list, into the MIDI notes list to say, okay, this is one of the keys that's currently being uh, held down by the player. And then if like me, um, you're using a buzzer to then uh, play the actual um, note that's been played, um, we're gonna use the tone function, which is a built-in uh, Arduino function. And we're gonna send a tone onto the audio out pin, which is the one that's got the buzzer connected to it. And we're going to, uh, this is that uh, lookup, S note pitches is the lookup into this table here, remember, um, that's going to give us the frequency uh, in hertz that corresponds to the note that's been played. So that's gonna play the correct um, pitch note on the buzzer. Uh, if, if your MIDI input is a keyboard that actually makes uh, 
a sound on its own or if you're using another method of making the sound um, you can comment that line out um, that's just because that's that's the the way I've got it to get some sort of audio feedback of the note that's being played and now the next section of code is actually to do with um, telling whether the input was correct for where we are in the puzzle so if the puzzles running what we do is we compare the pitch of the note that's just been played to whatever the note that's the current step in the melody so the melody remember was defined right at the top of the code uh, here and it's this sequence of MIDI notes in this order and the uh, what so what we look is we look at the position of the current step we're up to and the value of the MIDI note at that point in the melody and we compare it to the pitch that's just been played here uh, so if that pitch matches, that's what this double equality operator here means, if that pitch matches where we're up to, we'll move on to the next step. The player got it correct. If, having moved on to the next step, we've reached the uh, final step in the sequence, uh, the puzzle has been solved. So we'll call this onSolve method, and I'll show you what that is. That's a bit further down the code. So that's the, the criteria for saying if the puzzle has been completed, that we've got all the way to the end. Um, now this else here, this corresponds to um, the if that's here. So this is what happens if a note was played and it's the correct note for the next one in the sequence. This is what happens if a note was played and it was not the correct note in the sequence. So what we're going to do is we're going to loop over from where we're up to, so the current step, up to the total number of steps. So all the remaining steps in the sequence, we're going to loop over them, light them up red uh, with a short delay in between each one. So that's just going to have the effect of filling all the remaining LEDs with a, with a red light. Uh, when that's been done, we'll clear all the LEDs because remember we're kind of resetting the sequence back to zero. So we want the, uh, the LEDs to be clear again. And we'll set the current step of the puzzle to zero. The final thing we want to listen to in the note on handler is the case that uh, the puzzle state is not running but the puzzle's actually already been solved and when the puzzle has been solved the only input we want to listen to is that key that's been mapped to the reset pitch so when the puzzle's solved and the pitch is equal to the reset pitch we just find at the top which is a high B flat then we'll call the on reset method instead and that's what's going to um, reset the code from the beginning again Okay, we then got a, a slightly simpler function for the note off. So again, this is the, the callback function that's going to be triggered every time a note off message. So this is when the player lifts their finger from one of the keys on the keyboard and they're no longer playing it anymore. So the first thing we do, we remove it from the array of notes that's currently being held down. And then we take a look at that array. So if the MIDI notes array is now empty, this means that this was the last key that was being held. So no keys and no uh, are being held down at all anymore. So what we'll do is we'll call the no tone method. Again, that's built into the Arduino library uh, to stop any sound that was being played before because there's no keys being held. Uh, alternatively, this else here means that although a key has been lifted, we know that because that's why the note off uh, callbacks being fired in the first place. So although a key has been lifted, there must be other notes that are still being held down because the MIDI notes array is not empty. And if that's the case, what we're going to do is we're going to get the note value of the last key that was added to that array. So that's basically like saying the, the last key that was held down before this one was released and we'll play that note instead. Now that sounds a little bit complicated. Uh, it's actually what it ends up being is the behavior you would expect of a synthesizer keyboard. If you hold down the C key, you hear a C. If you then hold down the G key, it changes to a G. When you release the G key though, assuming you've still got the C key held down, you'd expect it to jump back to the C note that you were originally holding down. And that's what this uh, code here does. So it says if, if no notes are being held down at all, don't play anything. But if there is at least one other note being held down, play the most recent one that was, that was played. That's what that does.
Um, again, if you're handling a different way of actually playing the audio from your input, um, you might well, you might ignore this section completely, or you might rewrite it uh, depending on how you uh, want to handle the the audio generation. Okay, this next function here, this is concerned with how we uh, display the LEDs in the strip according to the current state of the game. So we look at the puzzle state. When the puzzle state is running, what we want to do is we'll light up the number of LEDs up to the step we're up to. So we start with the first LED, that's I0, and we'll count up until we get to the end of the strip. And for every LED that is less than the step we're at the moment, so if we're up to step three, what we want to do is to colour in uh, steps uh, zero, one, and two, green, for example. Uh, and for all the LEDs that are beyond the step that we're up to at the moment, we're going to colour them black, which is basically the same way as, as turn them off. That's what that means. So this whole section here, means that while the puzzle is running what we want to display on the LED is to light up all the LEDs up to the step we're up to at the moment. That's what that means. Alternatively, if the puzzle has been solved we're going to run this section instead and what this says to do is to first of all um, fade out any LEDs that might be lit at the moment and it's kind of a smooth fade. It reduces it by a, a percentage of where it was on each frame. So rather than just turning them all off you get kind of a nice fading out sequence. Uh, now this function here, this is a bit complicated, so this comes with the fast LED library and what this does here is it uh, creates a sine curve based on a, a given beat per minute tempo. So what this is actually saying is it's choosing a value uh, at 12 beats per minute between naught and the final LED, so that's number steps minus one because if we've got 12 steps, remember that the uh, counting system starts at zero, so you need to take one off there. So it says choose a, uh, a value along the LED strip that's going to oscillate in a sine curve at 12 beats per minute. So that's what that function means. And we're going to light that LED blue. But all the other ones, because of this fade to black at the beginning, all the others are going to fade to black. Um, and uh, and then we have a bit of a delay. So the effect of that is is to have a kind of a, a sine curve type uh, blue LED oscillating left and right. If you've ever seen the um, the old Knight Rider films, the kit car used to have a display on its front which is a red LED that kind of bounced left and right. It's very similar to that except using a blue LED instead. And it's a nice looking effect. It's quite simple and it looks nice. And then finally we call the fast LED dot show method. Um, so up to now, all we've been doing is actually updating the value of the LEDs array um, and determining what should be displayed at what position on the LED, what colour should go to what LED. This is the method that actually then pushes that array out to the strip and causes it to update. Okay, now we've got uh, two more sort of... I guess like callback type functions. These are called when the state of the puzzle changes. So on reset is called when the puzzle is reset. So every time the puzzle is reset, what do we want to do? Well, we're going to stop the audio to start with. So if any note was playing, let's turn it off. We're going to uh, use a color we haven't used before. So we'll use yellow for reset. Um, so we're going to light up all of the LEDs uh, yellow. Uh, we're just going to take a 20 millisecond delay in between each one and then what we're going to do is turn them black and clear the display. So that's just a, a little sort of visual indication to say okay we, we are resetting the, uh, the game. Uh, clear the LEDs and then what we'll do is we will set the lock to the locked state. And that We do that by sending a low signal onto the, um, the lock pin. And finally we actually update our own internal uh, state machine to say that the puzzle state is is running again. So this is the method that's called uh, after the game's been solved and you hold that reset key, that high B flat, it's going to call all this. Um, the onSolve method, so this is the method that got triggered a little bit earlier up here. Um, we called the onSolve method here. If the correct note was played we advance the current step and if the current step is equal to the whole number of steps we've got all the way through the puzzle we call unsolve and this is what it's going to do. 
it's actually very simple, it's just going to send a high signal to the relay, that will release the lock, and then we set the puzzle stage solved. Nice and simple. But again, let's say that you um, wanted to have some kind of uh, remote um, monitoring system here, you had like a, a room controller or a prop controller somewhere else, and you wanted to be informed when the puzzle has been solved, this is the function in which you'd place that kind of code. You'd send a message to say, puzzle has been solved or whatever. Um, so that's the point of separating these out into different methods. And then finally, we've reached the bottom of the code um, and the loop itself, the, the, so this is normally the loop in which you'd place most of your program code. This is normally the most complicated bit of it. This is very short and very simple. Um, so the reason being, that the way that that MIDI library calls, assigning those callbacks like we did to handle the note on and the note off messages, they get called automatically by the MIDI library when the keys are pressed. The only thing we have to do is call MIDI.read and that function there uh, checks, the, checks for incoming messages and it filters the messages and if any messages handle uh, are defined by callbacks that we defined up here. So we've defined a callback for note on and note off messages. You can define additional callbacks for other sorts of MIDI messages as well, but we haven't bothered doing that. So any messages that arrive that have an assigned handler like this will automatically trigger that handler. We don't need to call that explicitly at all. So that's literally the one line we need to have in our loop to handle all the MIDI input. And then finally, we just have this update display call. Um, and that was the method we just looked at here, which is just going to um, update the LED strip based on the current state of the puzzle. So again, if you didn't have the LED strip, if you didn't actually want to have the, um, the visual feedback and you just wanted the players to, to play the note and release the maglock, you wouldn't even need that line there at all. The only thing you'd have in loop is MIDI read. So as I mentioned, there's lots of ways you could customise this puzzle. Um, you could use different sorts of inputs. It doesn't have to be a MIDI keyboard. You could use a MIDI drum kit or some other sort of MIDI triggers that would detect input. Um, you certainly wouldn't have to use a buzzer like this. You could use a, a proper MIDI module like a synthesizer or maybe a, an MP3 shield on the Arduino or a wave uh, shield that triggered different sound effects for each of the keys here. That would be a really good way of theming it to, to any kind of theme you wanted to, to dress this puzzle up in. Um, again, the LED pixel lights don't have to be there if you don't want to have a visual indicator, or you could use some other way. Um, be nice to have, like I say, I mean, I think this would be super cool to do with different motors or servos triggered that actually uh, hammered physical chimes in the room. I might try that myself, I think, as a way of implementing this. That's pretty cool. Um, but if you have any uh, questions or comments about how to do any of these things, um, please just write them in the comments below. If you'd like to, I've shown you, I think, everything you need to be able to, um, to do this puzzle yourself. But if you want to download the code, or if you want to download the wiring diagram I used, or if you just want to um, support me doing more projects like this in the future, um, please check out the link to my Patreon page uh, where I've got lots of other similar um, uh, puzzles like this um, and if you're able to support me and if you want to that's super cool if you don't I will still carry on putting the, the videos up here on YouTube anyway so you can watch them there um, and I just really like hearing from you so if you've um, made this puzzle yourself I'd love to to see it or if you've got any questions and uh, I hope you found that useful and informative and I will see you next time thanks very much for watching